I wanted to welcome you all to the um, celebration of books and CDs published by Arts and Humanities faculty in the year 2020. Um, 2020 was quite a year to publish anything um, during COVID and we wanted to make sure that we had um, that we acknowledged these very important publications on our campus. I actually have been here 14 years and I'm not sure I've ever been to an event that um, brought together all of the publications from a given year. So I'm really excited that we're doing this and very hopeful that um, when it comes to the um, books and CDs published in 2021, that we will be able to do that this time next year in person. So um, I am just gonna get us started by introducing President Choi, who's gonna say a few words and hand it off to the next person. And then um, eventually we will get to hear a little bit from each of our authors. So. That'd be great. Thank you, Dr. Sakaritas. And uh, I appreciate the work by you and your colleagues for organizing this uh, very special celebration. And uh, to all of the faculty who made such important contributions to arts and humanities, even during this most difficult and challenging period dealing with the pandemic and many other issues. And uh, they've been very productive, publishing 27 books and one CD. And they range from new scholarship on Brazilian soccer to uh, a new variation on the uh, winter journey. And we know that most, if not all of the faculty members are here today so that we can honor them for their work and to uh, thank them for their many contributions. I look back at academic analytics and I found that during the past 10 years, MU faculty published more than 500 scholarly books. And obviously these are important indicators for scholarly outcome, uh, research and development and scholarship. But more important than that, these books and recordings and performances really do reveal a greater understanding of ourselves in our world. And they make us more empathetic. They make us more imaginative and more human. And there's nothing more important than that, especially as you deal with so many challenges that we've all faced during the past 15 months. So thank you once again, Dr. Sakaritas. And uh, it's now my pleasure to turn it over to our provost to share her remarks. Dr. Ramchan. Thank you. Thank you, President Choi. Uh, it's, um, you know, like, like you rightly pointed out, uh, the work that you all do, that our humanities scholars, uh, folks in the arts and humanities do, is, uh, is really what keeps us going in so many different ways. Um, and, and I really feel honored to be here, to be part of this celebration. And today we celebrate your writing, your books, your music, the creative works that so many of you enjoy doing and do so well. And in doing so, we're here really to to raise a toast to the imagination, the reflection, the discovery, and the creative genius that is here at Mizzou. Uh, and, and, you know, President Choi alluded to empathy. And I, I think, you know, empathy uh, is really the most critical skill for the next century. And the work you do is so important for us to develop empathy, but also to help our students, the next generation with skills and empathy. Um, I think it was Einstein who once said that uh, knowledge is limited, but imagination circles the world. And that's what today is about, the celebration of the imaginative genius of our scholar, writers, poets, and musicians. And, you know, I cannot imagine a more appropriate time and year to do this. Uh, I think back on wh where were we last year at this time? Um, we uh, honestly, I don't think I had, I had anything concrete to rely on, but I just had hope. And that hope kept us going, the hope that comes through reading things that are perhaps out there, but are not yet here. The imagination that we use to create hope was really what kept me going. And I know that I read more books outside my area uh, I listened to more music, I know that, and I really uh, enjoyed that because that's what kept me going. So this particular year is a special tribute to every one of you for the work you do, 
and kudos to you and thank you for inviting me to be a part of the celebration. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Pat Oker, soon to be President Pat Oker. Thank you. Um, I don't want to repeat, uh, I, I share many of the thoughts um, that have already been raised. I just have a few points I'll make real quickly. One is I want to thank all of you for being here. It is a real pleasure to see so many faces and all the work that all of you have done individually and collectively um, to uh, to really showcase the value and importance of research and creative activity in the arts and humanities. So thank you for being here and thank you for the work. Um, so I'm actually, because this is about uh, books and I'm gonna, uh, NCDs, I I'm actually, I have a book that I wanna tell you about real quickly because there's, a, 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 I'm reading a book right now and I came across a chapter called The ROI on Reading. <laughs> we don't normally talk about ROI, like that's, uh, uh, Provost Ramchand, that's in your world in some ways <laughs> rather than ours. And it's a fascinating study. I love this book. The book is called The Art of Impossible. I've been talking about it with many people by Stephen Kotler. I just want to refer to two things here. One is he does talk about here the value of reading, and I would extend it to also listening, but reading in terms of long-term concentration, reduced stress. These are, and he gives all the footnotes for all this. Um, staves off cognitive decline, improves empathy, sleep, intelligence. Goes on to say all these wonderful people, very highly successful and the ways in which they credit much of their success. But my favorite sentence in the, this book on the ROI on reading is when he talks that he compares reading books to reading other things. So you could read blogs, you could read articles. And his basic point is that if you study the amount of time that it took to write an article and the amount of time it takes to read an article, your return on investment is dramatically improved by going to the book because you get so much. And here's what he says. So he does this kind of, it's a little anecdotal to be fair, but he does this analysis of if you read a, a blog for three minutes, you get basically three days of work. If you read an article, for 20 minutes, you get four months uh, worth of work. If you read uh, five hours of a book, you get 15 years worth of work, right? So he does this, but this is a sentence that I love. He said, books are the most radically condensed form of knowledge on the planet. I love that. Like it is the density and that is what books, so it's not just reading is my point. And again, I say the same thing about a CD, right? It's not just a piece. It is the condensed. It is the years and years and years that go into producing a sustained argument or as, and, and that can be in many forms. So remember this, all you authors of books this year, the most radically condensed form of knowledge on the planet. That's all. Thank you. Oh, uh, uh, my pleasure, sorry, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Tom Spencer, Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just like to say thank you to all of you for your hard work and dedication during this challenging year and congratulations on all your accomplishments. So in the Office of Research and Economic Development, we're dedicated to providing support through professional development and in our internal funding programs. And in fact, last year we awarded nearly $275,000 in Research Council grants including funding 18 projects in the arts and humanities and social and behavioral sciences. We're committed to further support for creative scholarship through research development offerings by conversations with funders, including the National uh, Educate, sorry, Endowment for the Humanities and National Endowment for the Arts. And in fact, uh, we hosted a virtual workshop with program directors last summer and we're hoping to do the, more of that this coming year. Just trying to open the channels of communication in an intentional manner. And last year uh, in the Office of Research, we brought on Wendy Rinke as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research and Strategic Initiatives. And she is your connection for the arts and humanities and social and behavioral sciences. So please reach out to her with any ideas or concerns that you have and ideas about how the Office of Research could uh, support you better. And we'll keep you informed of kind of new initiatives that, through our newsletter and communication channels. And again, congratulations on your accomplishments. It's a painstaking journey toward publishing and presenting your creative scholarship in a normal year, much less during a pandemic. You all rose to and exceeded that challenge. 
And so thank you very much for your dedication to Mizzou. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Stephanie Shanikan. I have had the pleasure of working on this wonderful project and event with Alex Socarides and also with um, Susan Reno um, in the Office of, of Research. And Wendy has also been involved along with all our wonderful chairs in the arts and the humanities. So um, I'm very excited to um, kick off our first, our first group. Um, Alex and I were, um, we were convinced that we could find a way to hear the voices of all the authors. Um, and so um, even though there were a number of naysayers who said that we couldn't do it in, in, within this, this time period, we're gonna try. So we've divided them up um, into three groups and I'm so excited to be able to kick, it up, kick us off with the first group, which is the group that um, worked on the arts um, in, in some way, whether that is um, music, of course, which is, my, which is the love of my life, um, or short stories, fiction, um, poetry, film, um, that's, that's this group. Um, I'm also, I will, I will say that I am so um, encouraged by this event um, that I will sit my, sit, sit down and um, have to, to be careful with what, with what I say, sit down and make sure I complete my book so that I'm on the list for the, for the group next year. Um, so I'm pleased and honored to um, welcome these eight um, authors to our, to our, our um, group. I think they'll be spotlighted so that we can see them. Um, and we're, I'm just gonna go around and ask them to tell us a little bit about their work. Um, and basically you all have two minutes. I will time you um, two minutes or less. Um, the work that you do um, in the arts, in publishing on the arts, um, help us um, think of the world that we live in, um, in different ways. And, and I would say, I would argue that in so many ways are the work that we do in the arts and the humanities, but in the arts specifically, um, is, is a way to, that the world can access big topics, big issues, that are sometimes very difficult in textbooks and other ways. So um, I'd like for you all to talk a little bit about how your work helps us think about the world. Um, so I'm going to just call your name and give you a little time to a minute or two to, to talk about that. So first up, um, Juana Maria Cordenas Cook and Kristen Schwein, um, I'd like you to talk about Handmade in Cuba, Rolanda Estevez and the beautiful books of Edicios, Ediciones Vigia. Very good, Stephanie. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, um, this, is, uh, this is a book on which we worked uh, very hard with Kristen and also with uh, Ruth Behar. Um, this book was published by the University of Florida, and it is a collection of essays um, where we are examining in depth the Ediciones Vigías, which is a, an artisan collective publishing group in Matanzas. Um, this um, collective creates handcrafted exquisite art object books, and it brings together multiple aesthetics while it integrates literature and visual arts. It had already started building its books when in Cuba they had a catastrophic crisis, economic crisis of the special period in the 90s. The books then were, bu were built through bricolage, that is by using discarded materials, they couldn't buy anything else. And these artists, they said, it is not that we need to have a lot of funding, a lot of resources in order to create. We can create with whatever we have at hand. And they did it really using all kinds of discarded materials, the fabric, feathers, dead leaves, dirt, coffee grounds, and all kinds of unexpected items that could be found at hand in the street, in garbage cans or elsewhere. Um, they actually created absolutely beautiful, beautiful books. And <laughs> it was, um, 
thanks to a grant that uh, Christian Schwein wrote for the MU Research Council that uh, we were able to get a subvention to allow us to include in the book a large number of colored items. But um, I think that something that is very important to say is that this book, more than, um, more than uh, um, a product of anywhere else, is a product of the University of Missouri because of the incredible support we, we got from the University of Missouri. Um, we got like a Mizzou Advantage uh, grant that it was amazingly generous. It allowed for all of my research on Bihia, the filming of five documentaries and an amazing interdisciplinary conference, Cultural Brick College. We worked in this international conference with 50 member committee and Christine Schrein was one of the most committed colleagues. She was absolutely fantastic. It was a pleasure working with Kristen, but also with uh, the MacArthur Fellow, Ruth Behar. Um, the event was attended by world-renowned scholars, including a Nobel Prize Committee member, Swedish professor Ivo Zender. Um, uh, we, we also were able to found a beautiful collection of these books at the Museum of Art and Archaeology. And, um, and we were able then to have during the, during the event, 15 different exhibits on the art of bookmaking around the city of Colombia. Christine Schwein and Kathy Calloway created a beautiful guide to this exhibit. This is amazing teamwork, really. Um, and that we did also with the community of Colombia. There were several courses created around the art of bookmaking. And then- Hi, Maria, I'm gonna have to stop you. <laughs> okay. So sorry. Oh boy, um, we, we should have done this for two hours, but we want to get everybody in. Um, so I hope I'll, I'll start putting my hand up just to um, remind us of, of the time. I, you all worked so hard on this on these books that you could talk for hours ab about it. So asking you to talk within one or two minutes is, is really a, a very hard thing. So I apologize, um, but thank you. Um, I understand. <laughs> Kristen, would you like to add, add something? I'll just add very quickly that I think this book showcases the ways that art, that visual and material cultures can really showcase the ways in which cultural encounters change peoples. It's really, um, the Cuban anthropologist talks about transculturation and that's really what these books are about, about how certain cultures remained alive despite slavery, um, how others kind of emerged. And it really just shows the vitality and the ways of um, I'm now lost, I went off track, but it's essentially about kind of just how we see that all cultures are the product of contact mm -hmm. and that they, and that while those, those the people who are co in contact are not necessarily equal, all of them always change the other. And so to speak of any kind of culture as monolithic is inappropriate. This book celebrates kind of that diversity and the globalism that has been around for centuries. Wonderful. Thank you, Kristen and Juana Maria. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next, we'll go to Fang Wen, um, who um, will tell us a, very quickly about Roundabout, an improvisational fiction. Thank you, Dr. Shanikin. Um, I like what the president, provost, and dean have been saying about the role of reading and in instilling empathy. One of my favorite quotes on the subject of reading as empathy is from Steven Pinker, which is reading as a technology for perspective taking. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Roundabout was published in January of 2020, so it came out in this more innocent time. I had actually a live release party at Skylark Bookshop with a crowd, which seems like a very strange reality now. Um, so the book, uh, you know, is roundabout improvisational fiction. It's about a man who becomes self-aware as a character within a book and seeks to escape his author and is ultimately caught and is put on trial. 
I called it an improvisational fiction because it uses the rule of improv, which is yes and. I gave myself the assignment to incorporate every suggestion and whim and influence from the ideas of friends to things that came up in media to my own subconscious. And the result is this. It's a illustrated metafictional lipogram, which is a form of constraint writing in which you om omit certain symbols, in this case, the letter E. So it's an old literary tradition going back at least to the Greeks and Lassus of Hermione, who wrote a book without using the letter sigma. So uh, writing this book was very much about embracing my influences, including embracing the playfulness and weirdness of my own particular subconscious. I drew heavily upon quotes and references uh, with the constraint I imposed on my, upon myself. It was difficult to find quotes that I could use, but once I did find them, it was imperative that I incorporate them. And I'll just give the uh, uh, two examples, which is the ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, written without the letter E and uh, describing it as a story told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. So I followed up this project by publishing a piece in the literary journal December that used no vowels except for the letter E called 27 Genres. And I hope that is enough to pique your interest. Wonderful, thank you. Huh? Um, very good, I hope everybody's curiosity is, is piqued. Um, David, David, um, tell us about Edward Albee as as theatrical and dramatic innovator. Thank you. Um, uh, very excited uh, by your wonderful improvisation technique. I'm very excited about that. Um, uh, Edward Albee as a theatrical and dramatic innovator was really a labor of love for me. Uh, Mr. Albee, who was the three-time recipient of the Pulitzer Prize in drama, was not only the subject of my scholarship, but he was also a friend and a mentor uh, who came to Mizzou on several occasions at my request and, and wrote the forward to two of my books. So I was very close to um, this volume personally. Um, I co-edited it with uh, my esteemed colleague, Lincoln Conkle from the College of New Jersey. And it looks at the really unique and innovative contributions of Mr. Albee to both American and international theater. He was a really loud voice on pen and really fought for the rights of other writers, and he also left his entire $40 million state to the Edward Albee Foundation, which funds all kinds of artists of every kind. Um, it's part of a book series, uh, New Perspectives on Edward Albee Studies, which is a project of the Edward Albee Society, uh, for which I served as founding president and treasurer, and it looks at, you know, Mr. Albee's connection to uh, Russian theater, to Spanish theater, uh, looks at uh, his interest in the art world, uh, looks at how he worked very closely with designers, uh, very rare for playwrights to be producers. He was a producer of Funny House of the Negro, Dutchman and the Boys in the Band, uh, among a few plays, he produced many others. So uh, very, just very proud to A, be part of this wonderful group of Mizzou uh, scholars and authors, uh, so proud of all of you and proud to be part of you. Thank you, David. Um, speaking of theater, Claire Seiler, um, will you tell us about Casting a Movement, the Welcome Table Initiative? Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. It's great to be here. So I co-edited a book called Casting a Movement, which focuses on casting in U.S. theater, and it argues that casting is a political practice because an actor's body on stage or on screen always evokes at least two things. One, the dramatic character, and two, the cultural assumptions associated with the actor's skin color, gender, sexuality, and ability. So if you've heard of a little musical called Hamilton, you know that its casting invites the audience to see the nation's founding as portrayed by actors of black and brown bodies. And this is a kind of aspirational casting which works against the fact that historically actors of color have rarely had agency over their representation in US performance. And this book meets that challenge head on. It brings together 25 leading US actors, directors, playwrights, and scholars to discuss the politics of casting from different identity-based perspectives. So the book is, seven struct is structured in seven sections and each section focuses on a different casting perspective, including Native American, Middle Eastern, Asian American and disability culture. And we academics love to be cited, but I'm most excited when the ideas are used and put back into practice. And I'm excited to say that this book is doing that. 
I've been um, contacted by folks from high school theaters and then also um, the producers of Cirque du Soleil to say, hey, can we have a consultation about these, these ideas that you're putting forth in this book? So it's been exciting to see the way this book is having an impact from all kinds of walks of life. That's awesome, Claire, thank you. I'm a big fan of all of you. Okay, next, um, Spear Morgan. Spear, good, good to see you, friend. Um, tell us about Strange Encounters short stories. Yes, it's a collection of 15 stories collected from the last few years of the Missouri Review, our, our university's literary magazine for the last 44 years. Along with the magazine, TMR Books has become an award-winning series. And this year's collection highlights that one of the most frequent tropes in short fiction is the strange encounter. Those, those encounters that leave us with a feeling of how extraordinary life is. One example is Nathan Oates' story, The Dead Writer's Reading Series. And, and it's about a professor who hi hires a writer who is famous, but not too famous, who he knows has been dead for several decades for a live reading. And behold, the dead author shows up for the reading and actually does it, which suggests a lot of things, including the evanescent quality of literary fame. Another story is Tooth by Sung Yong Kwong, which tells the tale of a character named Tooth, an urban legend of North Korean prison camps who uses ventriloquism and contortionism and all kinds of tricks to spook gulag warders and to give hope to prisoners. Once again, in this collection, TMR celebrates the power and relevance of the short story, carrying on the tradition of William Peden, who was one of the most important ambassadors of the short story a half century ago. Bill would be delighted to know that during the last few years, TMR has been getting more and more international reads, including in places that we had no idea we had an, a significant audience, such as New Zealand, Australia, China, all around the world. We carry forward with that tradition, with this collection. Awesome. Thank you, Spear. Very impressive. Okay, two of my colleagues, uh, Stephen Tharp and Janice Wenger, will talk about a CD. Yes, uh, we had the pleasure of recording uh, Schubert's iconic uh, Winterreise, A Winter's Journey. I feel rather like an outlier in this group, not only because this is a music CD rather than a book, but also because we are recreative artists rather than strictly speaking creative artists. We take a work that has been performed many times through the last couple of centuries and try to um, get a fresh a take on it. I liked when uh, President Choi said that we, in a sense, were doing a variation because every performance is a variation on um, a work. Uh, we had the pleasure of performing this uh, in several different states throughout the country for on and off for a year and a half before we actually made the recording. And that was a great help to us because we were able to see um, videos of ourselves performing the cycle and uh, to, to get a good sense of what the shape of our performance was even before we went into the uh, recording studio. And I wanna turn this over now to Dr. Wenger to, to talk a little bit about the amazing instrument that we used for this recording. University of Missouri about 12 years ago acquired an instrument that would have been much like what Schubert would have owned. And in the current scholarship of performance practice, even the music of an earlier time, we try to explore the instruments and what they teach us and how they are different from, in this case, the modern piano. I've been working on that for years. When Professor Tharp came here, it was so exciting because he was interested in hearing that. I've already heard from people who heard a little of the pre-release version of the CD to say, well, I never heard that song cycle from that perspective with the kind of sounds of a historic instrument. If you haven't heard our lovely forte piano, you might think it was a harpsichord. It has a brightness and a clarity to the attack, but through the uh, technique of touch, 
dynamic variation is also possible, which is not possible in a harpsichord. So we were very interested to explore these 12 different songs from everything from a tuning point of view to articulation to tempo and how that instrument and its sound might have affected it. So we, it hasn't been officially released, but it will be in the next few weeks. Great. Thank you so much, Janice um, and Stephen. Um, let's see, I think that's, um, Na is Nancy in? Nancy. She's in the next, she's in the next group. Oh, she's in the next group. Okay, somehow it came on my list. Okay. Well, I think I'm done then. Um, I'll, I'll circle back at, at the end and say a few words, but thank you to my group of wonderful um, authors. Thank you. So I'm handing over to Wendy. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hi, this is really exciting and it's really impressive all the work that has been completed here and published in 2020. So I'm Wendy Rinke and I get to kick off our next group. Um, and this group includes authors who've written books that span the areas of history, politics, and the human condition. And they really, I think these books really demonstrate the breadth and depth of the work that's conducted here on our campus. And our authors include faculty from the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, History, Philosophy, Ancient Mediterranean Studies, and English. So with that, I'm going to start off with uh, Marcello Magata. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and the book title is Elite Burial Practices and Processes of Urbanization at Gabi, the Non-Adult Tombs from the Area D of the Gabi Project Excavations. So if you wanna share a little bit about your book with us, that would be great. And pronounce yes, your name correctly. <laughs> it's uh, Marcello Mogetta, but you know, I'm ah. used to all sorts of uh, variations. I on apologize. It. No, no problem. And uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I, I think this is a great uh, opportunity. And I was re reflecting on, uh, you know, the general theme of empathy. And uh, obviously it takes, a, you know, a certain level of empathy uh, to read uh, through uh, my uh, book because it deals uh, primarily with funerary rituals associated with the death of infants and young children. So it's not the easiest uh, topic, but, um, you know, besides offering uh, a window into, uh, you know, these uh, sad opportunities, um, uh, ancient mortality, of course, was much uh, higher than uh, it is nowadays. Uh, the evidence that we have uh, collected in the book also shows us how, you know, this, these occasions were, were transformed into, um, again, opportunities for statements about uh, status and rank. And I will say a little bit in a moment, but first I wanted also to acknowledge that this is the outcome of a uh, collaborative research uh, that I coordinated as part uh, of the Gabi project, uh, which is currently, I guess, the uh, largest American archeological excavation in Italy. So a little bit of bragging rights uh, here. Uh, and it also involves uh, Mizzou students, both uh, graduate and undergraduate uh, who come to the field uh, every summer. So uh, to say a little bit about Gabi, it's a uh, it's an abandoned uh, town near Rome, uh, which offers ideal conditions to reconstruct the full uh, arc, the full biography of city-states. So here's where the politics uh, come into play, uh, from birth to death. Uh, and um, we were able actually to expose the earliest uh, layer of the settlement um, where we have observed uh, in a way the embryonic stage of uh, what was the process of urbanization, the formation of cities. But definitely what we did not expect to find were a series of uh, lavish uh, burials of infants and young children associated with these uh, early habitation nuclei. Uh, incredibly rich uh, grave goods, uh, these are described and analyzed uh, in the book and you have to take my uh, word for it, but this was a big discovery uh, since uh, it proves, I guess, for the first time, even if by proxy, uh, that uh, pre-existing elites were acting as a uh, fossil of aggregation in emerging cities. And um, we're hopeful, uh, 
of uh, going back to Gabi in 2022, uh, you know, I would like to take this opportunity also to uh, say that uh, COVID has, of course, also derailed the plans for field work, uh, you know, across the board. So not necessarily for archaeologists. And this is definitely something that should be acknowledged, uh, at least uh, in the next uh, couple of years, as you know, the production cycle of research uh, progresses. Uh, but uh, you know, we're hopeful to get back next year. Uh, so expect more exciting news and eventually more books. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to go next to Victor McFarlane. Oil, oil Powers, A History of the U.S. Saudi Alliance. So could you tell us a little bit about that book, please? Sure, and thanks, Dr. Renke. Mm -hmm. My book came out with Columbia University Press. It's a history of the U.S.-Saudi Alliance concentrating on the 1970s. I used U.S. documents, many of which were only declassified in the last few years, so they weren't available to the public until now. And I used Arabic language sources that I gathered when I was at the King Faisal Center in Riyadh, um, which helped me do more justice to Saudi perspectives, which haven't played a big role in the historical literature so far. I also interviewed former American and Saudi policymakers. I focused on the 70s because that was the era of the oil crisis and the Saudi-led embargo against the US. Um, but instead of striking back or severing the relationship, American leaders decided that Saudi Arabia's influence over global energy markets and its new wealth made it an indispensable partner. So they built up US military forces in the Persian Gulf to protect Saudi Arabia. Those bases and the Saudi military paved the way for Operation Desert Storm and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq starting a permanent military presence in the region that continues today. Not everyone was on board, of course. From the very beginning, many Americans and Saudis objected to U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, support for the authoritarian Saudi monarchy, and some of the things that Saudi Arabia did with its oil wealth. So I tried to recover the history of that dissent, uh, which continues today, just like the alliance itself. That alliance has had a big impact on both the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, but it's also had effects well beyond their borders. The U.S. and Saudi Arabia have become two of the most important global actors in a political order and an economic system fueled by oil. And now that we're working to change our dependence on fossil fuels, I think it's more important than ever to understand how we became so dependent in the first place. I hope my book contributes to that effort. So I want to thank the history department and MU for giving me the time to finish this book. And congratulations to all of our colleagues who've published their books and are with us today. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yes. Um, I'm, let's go next to Jay Sexton. Um, and the book is entitled Crossing Empires, Taking US History into Trans-Imperial Terrain. I, thank you very much. Um, so to give you a sense of what the book's about, let me um, tell you how we often think about the history of Missouri and how we might better think about the history of Missouri. Um, if you read a school book or in a traditional uh, classroom, Missouri history would be presented as part of the history of the United States, that the nation would be the dominant frame through which we would understand the past. Um, I think we might uh, look at Missouri's history in a different way. We might see it instead as a contested site of multiple empires. Of course, at the beginning, it was native ground. There were indigenous empires here along the Missouri River, powerful Osage people, and further upstream, of course, the Lakota. Uh, Missouri also went through periods of, of French and Spanish uh, control or influence, informal British, um, also Confederate, um, before it became a part of the United States. And I guess that's what we're trying to do in this book. It's a, it's a team effort. This is an edited volume. We've got 13 contributors. We're trying to do two things. First, to say that the nation isn't always the dominant form of political organization in the past. Indeed, most often it's empires that are. And second, that um, empires are not self-contained units. They often pass from one to the other. Um, or even in their periods of their so-called apogee, when empires are at the peak of their powers, their borders are still porous. Um, one of my favorite essays in this book is one about the uh, uh, Jamaican laborers um, after the days of slavery, after emancipation in Jamaica, who went to Panama, 
um, to work on the Panama Canal, and then after that, um, resettled here in the United States. So that's a sort of sample of, of what we're trying to get at with this book. We're trying to open up U.S. history and to think about it in relation to the wider world. That's wonderful. Um, very interesting. Um, so let's next go to Linda Reeder. Italy in the modern world, society, culture, and identity, and emotional landscapes, love, gender, and migration. Those would be two books, not one long time. Oh, title. wow. Okay. <laughs> well, then you get, you're like, get special attention here. You got to, got to give us an overview on no, I, I can do it in less than two minutes. So <laughs> Italy in the modern world was actually born out of many, when I'm listening to Jay talk, many of the same questions that were driving his work on how do we understand national, the constructions or histories, national histories that seem so fixed and impermeable when they're constructed in these spaces that are transnational and spaces of migration. And this is particularly true of Italy, which is often considered a nation of emigrants where everybody leaves. But in the very act of leaving, the very idea of Italy was constructed. So my goal in this book was to write a national history that centered on both the making and construction of gender and mobility and migration, centering them in the very process of nation formation. And the other book is a collected essays. Um, uh, what is it called? What it was our final emotional landscapes <laughs> that also looks at migration, um, but really anchored through the uh, history of emotions lens and through the understanding or looking at our understanding of migration through love in particular and how love and all of the attendant emotions around love shape our understandings of migration and of migrant and many of the ways in which our politics of migration are really centered on these sort of emotional and empathetic or less than empathetic understandings of love of country, love of family. So those are the two books. Nice, congratulations on, on getting two books out in one year, that's great. Well, one was a collective um, effort. <laughs> oh, good, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so the next um, author is Paul Weirich. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, and your book is Rational Responses to Risks. Tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. So we've all been wondering how to handle risks during the pandemic. My book classifies and explains how to respond rationally to each type of risk. Risk is such a big topic that many disciplines have interesting points to make about it. Philosophy, my discipline, contributes standards of rationality for attitudes to risks and for acts to modify risks. Thanks to an MU research lead, I wrote my book while a visiting scholar at the Sorbonne University in Paris. I profited from frequent discussions with French economists and philosophers. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna transition to Brad pa Prager. Prager? Prager? <laughs> Prager's fine, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, and um, your book is The Construction of Testimony, Claude Lanzmann's Shoah and Its Outtakes. Mm -hmm. I brought it along for show and tell. Um, thank you very Thanks. much for, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for organizing the, the event and uh, our president and provost are a little bit familiar with this project, but I'm really glad to be sharing it with everybody that's here. Um, this volume, which I co-edited, is an examination of the 220 hours of outtakes and additional footage that were created during the production of Claude Lanzmann's epic nine-hour Holocaust documentary film Shoah, originally released 35 years ago in 1985. All of the additional footage, which is an amazing collection of interviews with both Holocaust survivors and Nazi perpetrators, is held as part of the collection at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Our scholarly examination, which is the first study of this amazing archive, first began as a workshop held at Mizzou, one in which major film scholars and Holocaust scholars from Australia, Germany, Canada, and Israel all participated. 
The final publication includes 13 groundbreaking new essays that challenge how we understand the concept of the outtake. And among them is my own chapter about the film's interview with the Holocaust survivor, Abraham Bamba, who is often referred to as the Barber of Treblinka. I am proud to say that the book, uh, the book also includes an authoritative appendix, which serves as a definitive guide to the museum's collection of outtake footage. It's been widely reviewed and Mariana Hirsch, the former president of the Modern Language Association stated in a published review that the work quote, signals a new phase in the visual history of the Holocaust. So thanks very much. Excellent, that sounds really interesting. Um, next, the next author is Dominic Meng Suang Yang and um, your book is The Great Exodus from China, Trauma, Memory and Identity in Modern Taiwan. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you to uh, the MU Research Council for, you know, partly sponsored this project and also to my uh, colleagues here for providing a very comfortable environment for me to write and think. Um, and the end product is this book, especially I would like to acknowledge Linda Reeder, who actually at the manuscript stage read a chapter and provide some very useful comments. So thank you very much, Linda. A shout out to Linda. Now, um, so what the book, what is the book about? Uh, it's about migration of 1 million people from China to Taiwan at the end of the Chinese Civil War, or uh, as the China specialists like to call it, the Chinese Communist Revolution. Uh, and now it's a very complicated story. And it's a story that's basically never told, if you can believe it, in, uh, you know, in, in, in any kind of capacity. So my focus is really on the trauma that's caused by family separation from the trauma of war and how you know this group of people actually sort of deal with that trauma and and the, as their uh, the how they perceive their displacement their situation change over time right and of course one of the highlight of the book is the, the return home chapter in which these people after 40 years return to China, you know, figure out that, you know, uh, 30 years of Maoism uh, have changed China so much that they can no longer recognize it. And that's another form of trauma. So for my sort of engagement with trauma, the theory of trauma, memory, and to a certain degree diaspora and identity formation, um, I come up with um, theories that are a little bit different uh, than traditionally from theory that comes from the Western social sciences. There are two different schools, the psychoanalytical school and the sociological school that both deal with traumatic memories. And for these uh, theoretical propositions, uh, the book is actually awarded the Memory Studies Association First Book Award for 2020. So... <laughs> Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, you know, so so uh, um, I mean, um, that's that's that, and I would like to thank everyone, you know, here, and uh, you know, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, congratulations on your award. That's spectacular. Um, and we're going to shift to the last author in our in this group. Um, it's Nancy West, and Nancy, your book is Masterpiece: America's Fifty-Year-Old Love Affair with British Drama. Hi, everybody. Um, so you all know the show Masterpiece, formerly Masterpiece Theater, I think. Um, January marked its 50th anniversary and also the 10th anniversary of the show that really put it on the map again, Downton Abbey. Um, so I wrote the book uh, to time with those anniversaries. And this is my first book written for a general audience. It's not a scholarly book. Um, although I did do an awful lot of research for it. And that includes watching the shows, re-watching the shows, looking at reviews, um, interviewing actors, writers, the producers of the show, both here and in Britain. Um, and talking to a lot of fans of the show, uh, people who had been watching it for 50 years, as well as more recent um, fans. And part of the book um, asks the question, well, what makes these shows such great drama? Um, what is it about the writing, the acting, uh, the cinematography, um, and the innovation? I mean, Masterpiece, 
has always had a kind of slightly um, bad rep as being stuffy and stodgy, you know, stuff our grandmothers would watch. Um, but it's a surprisingly innovative show in many ways too. You may remember I, Claudius from the 1970s. Um, that show was chock full of sex and violence and no other show had done anything nearly as risky before on television. And it's showing on PBS, it's just sort of astonishing. So I try to emphasize um, the ways in which Masterpiece really um, piloted some innovations that shaped television. And then the other big question of the book is why the cultural, what are the cultural reasons for its popularity? And um, here I look specifically at its American bent, why Americans love the show so much, sometimes more than Brits do. And so I have a chapter on um, its adaptations of classic literature, um, its adaptations of history, historical events, um, it's uh, use of landscapes and historic homes, all of the things that we as Americans feel we lack, um, history, great literature, um, you know, uh, intellectual, cultural sort of richness and a beautiful sort of rolling landscape and historic homes. Um, all of that sort of is reflected in the show. So those are the two angles I take. It was a lot of fun to write. Um, thank you for asking. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to Alexandra so we can keep th going through this journey of all this amazing work. Um, but thanks, I appreciate being here and, and hearing about all this, this amazing work that you've done. Hi everyone. Um, this has been really wonderful so far. Thanks for everyone who's spoken already. I have the last, the final group of the evening, which includes authors who have written books in languages other than English, um, books about art that appeared or was conceived in other languages, and books of texts translated from other languages into English. So this is a really kind of diverse um, grouping under the title translation, but it is not just translation. Some of these professors have their homes very logically in the School of Languages, Literature and Cultures, but not all of them do. We have um, ancient Mediterranean studies and English here as well. All of which is to say that the books published in 2020 show us that faculty on this campus are thinking and working across history and across languages to provide their readers with access to everything from the lives of early saints to 20th century Brazilian sports literature. Work of this kind often involves close manuscript study, extensive notes, and the challenge of both introducing and analyzing a work and often a culture to its readers. So I have, um, I thought five, but six authors here on the screen with me. And um, I'm gonna ask them each to speak and to tell us either to describe the book or I had thought maybe to say something about um, the most interesting part of your research um, process. Because some of these works are in languages that I do not speak the language of, I am not going to try to say the titles and make you all sit through that. So instead, I will just introduce you and please say the name of your book before you start. So why don't we start with Dennis Trout? Thanks, Alex. And uh, thanks to uh, everyone who's making this possible. It's wonderful to hear about the work of my colleagues. Um, my, the book that um, I'm talking about is called The Lives of St. Constantina. And it appeared in a series by Oxford University Press called their Early Christian Text Series. Um, um, it is a sort of multi-part, I was trying to figure out how many of those categories that you began uh, with I actually fit into, but it's a multi-part uh, book that has uh, uh, critical editions of uh, a number of Latin texts, uh, translations to English of those Latin texts, um, a commentary on those Latin texts, and uh, a substantial sort of introduction to the whole body. And uh, the figure at the center of it, uh, St. Constantina, is uh, fascinating. She was the historical daughter of the Emperor Constantine. Constantine, often thought of as the first Christian emperor, late Roman emperor, um, who became a kind of a bit player eventually in the, in the, uh, the uh, 
um, acts of one of the Roman martyrs, Agnes, and many of you might know Agnes from her various churches in Rome. Um, and the acts of martyr are something uh, something like the I Claudius of martyr acts. Uh, they're full of all kinds of uh, all kinds of sexual escapades. Um, uh, but Constantina then became a saint in her own right, and throughout late antiquity and Middle Ages, uh, a number of authors turned their attention to her. Um, we, and I say we because I'll more about that in a moment, but uh, did the first. Uh, made the first attempt to collate all the manuscripts relevant to these uh, different documents and to put them into a, crit a critical edition and create a basis for further scholarly research along with the translation. Um, the best part of this project for me um, is it was not just my project. It's the first truly collaborative project I was engaged in. I worked with um, a scholar who lives in Syracuse, New York, and a scholar who lives in, in Rome, uh, Virginia Burris and, and Marco Conti. Um, and uh, we spent two or three years emailing back and forth uh, on this and developed a remarkably warm uh, relationship. Virginia I'd known for some time, Marco I just met through this project. Uh, but I realized as I thought about it, the fun I think about this was to realize what a learning community it takes to pull something like this off from people in research council who made it possible for me to to go to Rome and spend some uh, some months at the American Academy as a visiting scholar uh, from um, the fund the department has uh, established in the name of my colleague, Barbara Wallach, made it possible for me to spend a week or two in, in Syracuse uh, from a friend who was happened to be on the spot in, um, in, in Rome when we needed a few photographs um, to um, my daughter who actually did the, as a graphic designer and did the, the maps and the plans for the volume. So um, the joy of this was actually being part um, more so in this project than any other I've undertaken of a real group of folks concentrated on producing a, a kind of fundamental text. It's sort of amazing that we still have texts that have not been critically edited. Um, one thinks of the past has already been deeply mined, but in fact, there are all these wonderful pockets of things that still to be discovered. And I hope that, uh, that that's something that others will continue to do. So thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Let's go to Jack Draper. Hello, thank you for organizing this wonderful event to the organizers. And uh, the book that I'm presenting is a uh, translation and critical edition called The Black Man in Brazilian Soccer, which is the first ever translation to English of a book that was originally published in Brazilian Portuguese in 1948 and then uh, a, a second edition in the 60s. Um, in 1963. And I conceived of this project in 2016 when I realized this book had never been translated to English. And I got a grant from the Duke University, University of North Carolina, Latin America in translation and traducción and traducción series in 2017 to fund it. And uh, it includes a preface for and notes for the English speaking audience. It traces from the lesser known, basically a history of desegregation and increasing involvement of Afro-Brazilian players in the sport, which had begun, it starts with the beginnings in a, where it had basically was an elite white pastime in, in Brazil in the early 20th century. And then um, the Afro-Brazilian players became more and more involved as it transitioned from amateur to professional and they broke through the color line in the sport. Um, and he tells the Mario Filio, the author, chronicles the struggles of black athletes, coaches, and fans against continuing racism, even as they were helping to shape this iconic Brazilian style of play. And you see uh, generation, several generations of black Brazilian stars prior to Pelé, who's the culmination of the book. Arthur Friedenreich in the 10s and 20s, teens and 20s, Leonidas da Silva in the 1930s and 40s. He was the star of the 1938 World Cup. And then finally, the king of soccer, Pelé, is in the final chapter of the book in the 1950s and 60s. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Johanna Kramer. Yeah, um, I, what uh, Dennis was talking about really reverberated with me. Um, here, I brought the book to you. I have to, no, can't see it here, there it is. Um, 
um, because mine, uh, my book also is a collaborative um, uh, book and it was also made possible by some funding from, from Mizzou that made it possible to go uh, to England to look at um, early medieval manuscript um, for this project. But I worked together with uh, a colleague at Queen's University Belfast and with um, another colleague at Carleton University in Ottawa. So it was also an uh, intercontinental and uh, international project. But um, the book is a, an edition and translation, a facing page edition and translation of 22 texts that were originally written in Old English. That is the language that was written and spoken um, in England from about 450 to 1000 common era. Um, so the oldest recorded language stage that we have in English. Um, and these texts are all prose texts and they're anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. And importantly, they record the lives of saints. So I'm excited to be in a group where we have two books that are about saints' lives. Um, how about that? Um, and so these lives of saints record the lives and deeds and especially then the deaths of, um, of the saints that they celebrate. And they range from um, uh, the subject range from our, the Archangel Michael to early Christian saints like St. Margaret, all the way to 7th century English saints um, like Mildred and Saxburg. So actually really recent um, saints from the perspective of these authors who wrote these texts. And our book um, provides all new editions from, from the manuscripts, um, some re-edited after a hundred years after their first editions. Um, so they sorely needed to be re-edited. And for some of the texts, we um, we wrote the first translation. So they had never been translated into English. And the idea was to put these um, between two covers that they're more available to students, to scholars in the field, um, that people can work on them because they were some of them were really difficult texts to find, actually get your hands on. Part of that um, effort is to publish in a series by Harvard University University Press that's called Dumbarton Oaks uh, Medieval Library, which is modeled on the low classical library, but it does that for texts, uh, for medieval texts. Um, so all the volumes will stay in print and they're affordable and therefore people can, um, can get access to them. So to give you a little taste, um, um, of course, the Saints' Lives document the exemplary lives of or extraordinary ordinary people that have sort of a special connection to God, but they, they're models for us um, to live by. And um, um, I, I don't have sort of exciting moments from the research except looking at manuscripts, because that's what Alex mentioned, like so, something fun or interesting about the research. But um, I will read you my favorite sentence or a couple of sentences from one of the lives that I worked on, which is the life of St. Nicholas. This is where we you know, get Santa Claus from, but the, the, the original saint, um, as it were. Um, and as you will see, he was already as a child, so this, the life tells his life from his birth on, but he was already a very virtuous baby, as you will find out um, uh, very soon here. As soon as he was born and was nursing on his mother's breast, he was accustomed each Wednesday and each Friday to nurse only once a day. And after that remained in this state until the next day. Truly, by this sign of God, it was revealed how great a man he was to become. So even as a baby, he was already fasting. So take, take a page out of that book. Thank you. Um, we now, I just want to say we have three authors here tonight who are all here for two books. So Linda was the first one, but now we're going to go back to Juana Maria, um, who's going to tell us about her second book. But you're on mute though, Juana Maria, sorry. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And I want to, to thank uh, the opportunity to share some of my research. Um, the second book is Before a Mirror, the City. And it, and, uh, it was published in 2020, like everyone's. Um, this is a bilingual anthology of poetry by Nancy Morejon. Um, I want to say that my research has concentrated in the African diaspora in Latin America. And Cuba is a Latin American nation where the African diaspora has had the strongest and most brilliant development of intellectuals. Nancy Morejon, Cuban, is the leading contemporary Afro-Latin American poet. 
She has produced a plethora of texts on a wide range of topics, including the people in the landscape of the city, which she adores. For almost three decades, the University of Missouri has been Nancy Morejon's home in the United States. She has repeatedly visited our campus, including for the International Symposium we celebrated in 1995. It was all around her poetry. And uh, from that symposium, there were all kinds of publications that came out, including a special issue of Afro-Hispanic Review. Furthermore, since 2006, we have established the Nancy Morejon Afro-Romance Special Collection in our own Museum of Anthropology. In the poems we selected, Morejon does not explore the grandeur of Havana. Rather, she exposes the everyday experiences of marginal people who never have had and never will have monuments erected in their honor. The poet guides her wide embracing gaze along the city streets and give expression to a broad thematic scope that involves the realm of the quotidian with some surrealistic images. At the same time, she also inscribes in the open spaces of the city, the body of the black woman affronted and scorned since the days of colonial slavery. Havana emerges from these poems as a stage for meetings and separations, for pleasure and pain, for life and death, where often contradictory elements con converge. But Havana is always luminous, but suffering, and at the same time, unforgettable. Nancy Morejon's voice is marked by a profound sense of love, faith, at the same time, belonging and reaffirmation with hope for a, for a brighter future after so many losses and decay in the city of Havana. This is this, is this book. Uh, let's see, I don't know if you can see it. No, it doesn't show in the image, but anyhow, it's a, it's a book that has been uh, really very precious and I have enjoyed very much working on and actually my fifth book on Nancy Morejon. Thank Thanks you so very much. much. Thank you. Um, and for our third author tonight, who's also written two books, we're going back to Brad Prager to talk about his other book. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Juana Maria. That was very beautiful. Um, <laughs> this is a this is a book I co-edited on the Austrian avant-garde filmmaker Ulrich Seidel, and uh, the uh, the fun thing about it um, is that Austrian avant-garde filmmaker is pretty much exactly as exciting as you think it is. Um, <laughs> if whatever you may be picturing now, you're right and worse. Um, and so he was a lot of fun to work on. It's a collaboration with colleagues at the University of Bamberg in the Department of Literature and Media. And it was important to me to work uh, in German on this book because that's really where the reception of Zeidel's uh, really fascinating films are. So I recommend look them up, take your chances. Um, and uh, thanks very much for hearing about it. Great. And our last um, author of the evening, uh, Guadalupe Perez and Zaldo. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Alex, and happy to be here. So I'm going to talk about my book. I don't know if you can see it. No, nope, you cannot. <laughs> well, this is a collective effort. Um, its title is Memorias Globalizadas in Spanish, but basically is a bilingual anthology. And it is an interdisciplinary study about the social, cultural, and political impact of globalization and migration as seen in the literary works written by contemporary Latin American writers. And really, when I say contemporary, that is so true. Most of the others are very young and mostly are from Central America, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. So these writers are focusing in migration. And I hear Linda and Dominic talking about migration in Europe and China and Taiwan. And here, these Latin American writers are focusing in migration, but in the one that we have so close 
de um, Central American caravans and all those problems of the migrants have to confront. So um, what I have to say is that um, this anthology contains two essays written in English and five of those essays are written in Spanish. And this, um, I, I wrote the introduction and I co-edited this anthology. And I also wrote one of the chapters, chapter six. So each scholar analyzes how the Latin American writers represent the physical and intimate struggles suffered by migrants who are forced to leave their homelands, uh, either by violence and, and poverty. In these Latin American writers' uh, symbolic words, the characters are continuously problematizing the notion of national and individual identity in this globalized uh, world. But uh, what is most important to mention is that they are denouncing the dehumanization of migrants in this globalized uh, world, and they are um, trying to, to humanize their experiences. So this is basically what my anthology is about. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am going to send us back to Stephanie Shonakin for some final words. So thank you everyone. Um, again, I hope to be one of the spotlighted next year. Um, we really do hope that this um, event becomes an annual event that people look forward to. And I think it will really encourage folks to um, continue doing good work. Um, these, all these books are um, excellent um, and they excellently showcase what we do in the arts and the humanities. Um, so very quick, and we stayed with, well, we're a little bit old over our time, but we 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 gave it a, a good shot. Um, next year we'll be in person, hopefully. Um, we've created a really wonderful image, a visual image of all the books on the shelf. Um, and that will be something that we get to um, hold on to, and maybe we can make a poster um, of, of these books. And every year it'll be a different poster. Um, so I want to thank the chairs who worked on this with us. Um, it is the chairs of our departments that really do the work of, of holding up our faculty and giving and um, helping them to, to, to do this work or to have time to do the work. So um, our chairs are Sean, Sean Gerd of Ancient Mediterranean Studies, April Langley of Black Studies, Catherine Rimp of History, Paul Weinrich of Philosophy, Andy Hoberic of Slick, um, uh, Leanne, Garrison of School of Visual Studies, Heather Carver of Theater, um, Linda Reeder of uh, Women and Gender Studies, Matt Gordon, Linguistics, and Julia Gaines of Music. I think I got them all. Um, also want to thank Chris Pierce and Kate Neckerman um, in the Dean's office who have been really encouraging. Um, when we think of research, we should always think of the incredible work that is being done by our faculty and our, our, our scholars in, this, in the arts and the humanities. Um, and of course, thanks, lots of thanks to the Office of Research, in particular, Susan Reno and, Win, and Wendy Renke. Um, and so thank you very much. Thanks to Alex for um, working on this and for, for encouraging and prodding and nudging. Um, we hope to see you all next year. Maybe there'll be more books from this group. So thank you.